Hello, this is David from DN Cognitive Counseling. Tonight I'd like to clarify some of the issues that people are having with the video I did on systemic racism. In that video, I was attempting to clarify what some people have misconceptions about. And in some of the comments, people continue to seem to have the same misconceptions. So I want to be very clear and maybe I could take you through it a couple of steps that might help you to understand a little bit better of what I'm talking about. So in the first comment, um, Kathleen states, as a child of legal immigrants, I've experienced injustice. We never blamed the government. We just worked two jobs and thank God for the opportunity to be free. Perhaps instead of blaming the government, look to the culture that endorses folks who do not have the means or ability to provide for children and without a plan for the future, bringing them to a world without that what they need. Now, the, the issue that Kathleen brings up is the issue that people take personal responsibility. And when I work with people, I absolutely agree that there's an aspect of personal responsibility that every single individual needs to take in order to set themselves up for success. Immigrants do come to this country, generally with very little, and they work themselves to the bone in order to provide for the next generation. There's no question about that. But when we're talking about systemic racism, that's like talking an apple and an orange. I am not talking about the idea that systemic racism means that a person could not be successful. I've never met a client that I ever believed could not be successful. I talk to a lot of the kids that I see, a lot of the adults that I see, and I always talk to them about what they need to do. But that's got nothing to do with the aspects of systemic racism, and I'll talk about that a little bit, lo a little bit later. Cindy says, a closer look at systemic idios idiosity, idiocy. Well, again, I, I don't think what I'm going to present to you tonight is idiotic. I think that there are things that basically we need to take a look at as a society. Now, if you believe what I'm going to talk about tonight is absolutely fair and should continue, I will say, okay, I understand you have a point of view. Hopefully, you'll at least hear something that I'm trying to explain and you'll rethink it maybe just a little bit. Maybe to say to yourself, maybe there is a possibility of it. Lonnie writes, systemic racism is a term invented by John Stewart writers and isn't real. This is, an this is an imagery that makes it perfect obstacle for liberals to attack and conquer. It creates BLM, a militant arm of the Democratic Party, to destroy property, murder innocents during an election year, and blame the destruction of, that, of other innocents. So yes, systemic racism is very bad. You can end it by jailing and killing Black Lives Matter members, holding the creators and funders accountable with the same punishment. Again, Lonnie, I think it's very important to understand I think that you are overgeneralizing what systemic racism is and utilizing something that people who are have an entire different agenda and political agenda and, and in my opinion they're utilizing horrific tragedies as a means of literally and stating trying to destroy the natural systems of this country. I think that you can believe that systemic racism is an issue and problem without believing that you have to jump to Black Lives Matter as an organization, not Black Lives Matter as an ideology, because I personally believe that every black life does matter. So the aspect of saying that you need to throw out, again, the baby with the bathwater, doesn't need to happen here. It's not an all end all, an end all or be all of one point or another. David then says systemic racism is a myth. Perpetuating this myth is resentment across the nation, and that is a shame. Well, I wish it was a myth. Um, I don't think that systemic racism is a myth. I do believe there's an overgeneralization. So what ends up happening is people will be able to point to situations where um, other races are either doing better in certain things or um, other people of, of, who, are, who are white or suffering horribly and go, you see, there's no systemic racism. But that's a misunderstanding of what systemic racism is. What you're really talking about is the individual aspect. And there's two different aspects here. There's an individual and what an individual can do. And then there is what societal pressures do. And those two things are very, very different. 
You as an individual could overcome a lot. It doesn't mean then you didn't have a lot to overcome. David goes on to say, there's an unfortunate, well, there, this is and unfortunately will always be racism, bigotry, and sexism. I, I can't argue that there'll always be some level of racism, bigotry, and sexism. The question is, do we want to accept it? What levels will we accept it to? The problem being, it's not systemic. It's in the past. It did exist. And there is a case to be made that it may have some economic bearing on the present. That being said, why has black society declined with all its advancements made in civil rights, poverty, Appalachian suffers, at least as bad as the median household income is lower, unemployment is extremely high, yet the crime rate is half the national average. At some point, personal responsibility and life choices must be acknowledged and the real problem in black America. And, and again, I'm not going to even deny that anything you're saying about the issues in, Af in African-American communities and the problems in their households, the single parent homes, the inability for a lot of personal responsibility to be taken, I'm not going to argue that. It's not what the issue is. The question is, outside of that, is there also systemic racism? And does that systemic racism lead behaviorally to certain of those problems? And, and we need to look, look at that also as well. Um, and again, um, Anthony says, Condoleezza Rice sums up the Democratic Party in 75 words. And again, I know that people are utilizing this as very political. Like you must be on the right or the left in order to believe this. And it's just not true. But let's just take what Anthony says. If you are taught bitterness and anger, then you will believe you're a victim. You will feel aggrieved. And the, and the, and the twin brother of aggrievement is entitlement. So now you think that you're owed something and you don't have to work for it. And you're really bad road and nowhere because the only people will pe play to the sense of victimhood, of aggrievement, and entitlement, and you still won't have a job. And again, for the individual, I absolutely agree that an individual has to try to do better. But that means also as a society, I think we need to do better. And let me, let me approach this in a different way. Let's approach this not from the standpoint of the systemic racism, from the standpoint of the majority culture dealing with a minority. Let's deal with systemic racism from a minority culture dealing with another minority. So this way, maybe you'll understand a little bit about how this could work and why maybe you could see that there is something called systemic racism, but it doesn't mean that you need to tear down society and run to the nth degree. I think part of the issue is that so many people are afraid that if they admit their systemic racism, therefore now, they're right. We need to tear down everything and destroy everything. That's not true. But what we do need to do is acknowledge it. I'll give you an example of Jim Crow. Jim Crow were a bunch of laws on African Americans that were absolutely unfair. They were, I mean, they, ultimately they were illegal. But at the time, those were the laws. They made these laws that held African Americans after slavery and after supposedly they were going to be free. They made laws to hold them down. Absolutely a statement of historical fact. I don't hope nobody here says there was no Jim Crow, never happened. So the question becomes, did we say at that point that the laws should all be torn down? We must get rid of law in order to get rid of Jim Crow. Or did we say, no, these laws were bad and we need to work to fix them? It didn't mean we needed to destroy the country. And I think that this idea that if you acknowledge systemic racism, therefore the country must be destroyed is an irrational argument being made by a bunch of people today. But it's irrational. You can acknowledge that systemic racism exists. You can acknowledge it as a problem. You could work towards fix those problems as we did with Jim Crow laws without destroying society. So with that being said, I want us to remember something that happened not too long ago. And this took place during the Obama administration. I'm sure many of you will remember it as soon as they stop playing it. Well, I'm the head of the executive branch and the attorney general reports to me. So I've got to be careful about my statements to make sure that we're not uh, impairing any investigation that's taking place right now. Uh, 
but obviously this is a tragedy. Uh, I can only imagine what these parents are going through. Uh, and when I think about uh, this boy, um, I think about my own kids. And you know, I think every parent in America uh, should be able to understand uh, why it is absolutely imperative that we investigate every aspect of this and that everybody pulls together, federal, state, and local, uh, to figure out exactly how this tragedy happened. So, if you haven't figured it out already, this is the situation that took place with Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman. Now, Barack Obama came out and said, this is a, and by the way, tragedy, yes, absolutely a tragedy. But I want you to understand that this was one case in one area but we need to bring down the state, local, and federal governments. I'm going to ask you, during the same year, how many other people were murdered? How many other people had situations that might have been similar? Did a Barack Obama order a state and local and federal government investigation on every single one of those cases? Look it up. He didn't. What made this one case so special that it got so much attention. And now I'm not saying we should not look when people are murdered, because they, we should. But from a criminal standpoint, we should go through that system. But when it happens, why do certain cases become more polarized or more identified than others? Uh, so uh, I'm glad that uh, not only is the Justice Department looking into it, I understand now that uh, the governor of the state of Florida has formed a task force to investigate what's taking place. Uh, I think all of us have to do some soul searching to figure out how does something like this happen. And that means that we examine uh, the laws and the context for what happened, uh, as well as the sp uh, specifics of the incident. Uh, but my main message is, is uh, to the parents of uh, Trayvon Martin. Um, you know, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. And, um, you know, I think they are right to expect that all of us as Americans uh, are going to take this with the seriousness it deserves and that we're going to get to the bottom of exactly what happened. All right. Thank you. So, Barack Obama, in his own words, say, if I had a son, he looked like Trayvon. And that's why this is so important to me. But I ask you, does it matter that, the, that Trayvon looked like Barack Obama? So if Trayvon Martin looked like me instead of Barack Obama, it would be less important to investigate it at that point and we wouldn't need to care about it? Can you see that there is a bias that Barack Obama is acknowledging by stating that this child could have looked like my child? And because of that, now I have a much greater interest in what happens. And psychologically, can you think that maybe, just maybe, that many people operate this way? That maybe this is not just a Barack Obama thing, that, that he himself sees Trayvon Martin and then sees part of his family or a closeness to it and therefore becomes more reactive, that maybe police officers who see people who are similar to them or their family members might react differently than to somebody who they don't see? Or maybe that judicial um, uh, um, judges in the, in, the in the judicial system might be acting very differently with people who they see as similar to their family? Can you see that maybe that when those things are taken in totality, that when you have it in, in in exemplified and, and, and increased over time, that you're going to see great disparity in certain things. For example, if judges are sentencing people and they, they feel more an affinity for one type of defendant than another type of defendant, you're going to find that they're going to be more likely to advocate for one over another. 
in many places that I have worked. I have fought against this type of thinking all the time, where people will be like advocating for this person to get specialized treatment because there's an affinity or some identification. One of the things that I'm evaluated on every year, and through the years actually, was on that I've always had the ability to put that aside, to look at people not as, oh, I like this person more than this person, so this rule should be less applied here, and this person I don't like so much, then this person should be a little more applied here. It shouldn't work that way. When Barack Obama says that Trayvon Martin could have been my son, it would have been nice for him to say, and I think George Zimmerman, what would I want if he were my son? What if my son was the perpetrator? What would I have wanted then? Because the fact remains, those things get switched. So being able to say that Trayvon looks like my son, therefore now I want a federal, state, look, I want everything looked at. Every case in the entire country doesn't get this. So why this special treatment? And if Barack Obama was president for 250 years, obviously not, but if he was president for 250 years and did this over and over and over in people who he says look like my son, would you feel that there'd be something called systemic racism? Would you say things are unfair? I don't understand this. How could this be allowed to happen? How could the government keep looking at these cases with more affinity, more strength, more pressure, but when people like me get killed, they don't give it as much pressure and attention? How would that make you feel? Would you say, wow, that's great, Pull, don't worry about it, You just work harder? Would you say, I feel this is not fair, and it hurts me, and it makes me feel like the systems are not fair. It doesn't mean I still can't be successful. But it does have a feeling that that sucks. That's, that's a life that I don't want to have to continue to feel in all the time. It's going to breed anger and frustration. What do you mean Trayvon Martin gets all of this? What about the death in my family? What about my son who was killed? Why doesn't he get the same thing and the same treatment? And when you make these disparaging aspects, it's going to breed that. So I actually agree with some of the comments that talked about the idea of when you make disparag disparaging, disparaging um, rules for different people and there, you see it on a systematic basis, it's going to breed emotional feelings. That does not mean the system needs to be taken down. It means we need to understand what's actually going on and see what we could do to make it better and fix it. It's not one or the other. It's not, oh my God, systematic racism exists, therefore now the system needs to be destroyed. Because no matter who's in charge, no matter what the situation is going to be, you're going to have these problems because psychologically, these are normal things to take place. They're part of human behavior. We grew up in families, and we care more about our family than we care about other families. And that is actually psychologically healthy and normal. The problem is when you care about your family more than other families, there are going to be systematic issues. The same thing applies for jobs. How do most teenagers get their first job? You ever think about that? You think that most teenagers go ahead with no experience and go, Hi, my name is John Doe and I want to apply for this job. Thank you very much. What experience do you have? None. Thank you. You're hired. Do you think that happens often? Most of the time, younger individuals need to get the door open for them. And the number one way it happens is called nepotism. Nepotism is when you know somebody, a family member, a family friend, and they give you the ability to work under, to be there for this, to get your first opening so you can put something down on a resume and be able to start your process. Now, in order to have nepotism, you need to have people around you who are going to be open to that. 
So one of the things that happens with nepotism is that you know somebody who then lets your child in or you let somebody else's child that you know in and it gets the ball started. Then it's about them and them doing. But for many people that don't have those connections, they don't have the nepotism. They don't have the ability to get in. So that first getting in makes is much harder. Not impossible, but much harder. Another uh, factor, and I love this one also. Recently, uh, Professor Henry Lewis Gates Jr. was arrested at his home in Cambridge. What does that incident say to you, and what does it say about race relations in America? Well, uh, I, I should say at the outset that uh, Skip Gates is a friend, uh, so I may be a little biased here. Uh, I don't know all the... I love, first off, that Barack Obama acknowledges that he's biased. I, I love it, because the truth is, it's true. He has a bias for his friend, which, by the way, again, is normal. So when your friend has a situation, as many p police officers would do, to a DWI who they knew the guy, and it's going back years, if they knew the guy, it would be, just get out of here. When they didn't know the guy, it's okay, you go into the, uh, the drying out place. But the fact remains that that idea of that connection let people out. PBA cards. PBA cards. Yeah, anybody have one? Anybody ever use one? What do you think that is? How do you get a PBA card? Who gives them to you? How does that work? Is that fair? Is that everybody equal under the law? Everybody's held accountable the same way? What do you think that does to people's feelings? What do you think that does to the idea of fairness? Facts. What's been reported, though, is that the guy forgot his keys, uh, jimmied his way to get into the house. Uh, there was uh, a report called into the police station that there might be a burglary taking place. So far, so good, right? I mean, if I was trying to jigger in, well, I guess this is my house now, so <laughs> it probably wouldn't happen. But let's say my old house in Chicago. Um, here I'd get shot. <laughs> but so, so far, so good. They're, they're, they're reporting. The police are doing what they should. There's a call. They go investigate what happens. My understanding is at that point, uh, Professor Gates is already in his house. The police officer comes in. I'm sure there's some exchange of words, but my understanding is, is that Professor Gates then shows his ID to show that this is his house. And at that point, he gets arrested for disorderly conduct, um, charges which are later dropped. Now, I've, I don't know, not having been there and not seeing all the facts, what role race played in that. But I think it's fair to say, number one, any of us would be pretty angry. Number two, that the Cambridge police uh, acted stupidly. Now, here you get the bias all over again. And if the Cambridge Police Department, after he showed his ID, arrested Mr. Gates, for breaking and entering or burglary, and then I absolutely would agree that you could say, how stupid are the police? They arrested a man in his own home. That was not the charge. As you heard, the charge was disorderly conduct, which then begs the question, what in the world did Mr. Gates do to the police officer that made him get arrested? Now, the fact that the charges were dropped has nothing to do with whether or not Mr. Gates was guilty of the crime. There are many times where somebody is guilty of a crime, where they actually went over it, but for a variety of reasons, charges get dropped. And it might have been because there were some high political friends that said drop it, and we're dropping this for political reasons. So the aspect of saying, well, the charges were later dropped, therefore means that Mr. Gates then should never have been arrested, therefore the police acted stupidly, is totally biased. Now, can you see that if the system was working this way, 
all the time the opposite way. And would you see maybe that there's bias then possible from other people and they've been affected by it? And again, this has got nothing to do with being able to be successful. Because you could be very successful in this country even if there is systematic racism against you. No question about it. It doesn't change the fact. I'll give you this as an example. Um, economic, um, economically, Jews do pretty well in this country. Uh, it doesn't mean all Jews, because it does not true, but as a group, if you lumped up Jews and said, okay, how are they doing as, as, as a people in terms of that group, you would see, financially speaking, they're doing pretty well. Does that give the idea that there's no anti-Semitism? Does that mean that Jews aren't the victims of crime of anti-Semitism? Does that mean Jews have not been killed due to anti-Semitism? That means that anti-Semitism doesn't exist because they're financially doing well and they're able to overcome anti-Semitism? One doesn't have anything to do with the other. In fact, the biggest problem in the argument of systematic racism that people don't understand is they'll show you a chart and say blacks or African-Americans are over here and white people over here, therefore systematic racism. The first thing you learn in any experimental psych class or in any um, statistics class, the first thing you learn is correlation does not imply causation. First thing you learn. Yet every argument that they make about systematic racism is normally a correlational argument. But that's not the argument to make. What you could see is in individual cases how this manifests. And if you could see it in case after case after case of physical manifestations of it, then you have to say it exists. The question is to what level and what effect that is an argument that you know how can say, well, let's take a look at this. And by the way, when you look at the studies on this, you're going to get varying degrees depending on who's taking the data and how they want to interpret it. But to say it doesn't exist is basically in denial of reality. You can actually see it. In this particular case, I am showing you systematic racism from Barack Obama. Now, He's not doing it on purpose. He's not a horrible individual in person. He is basically, because of his own bias, reacting in the case of Trayvon Martin as it's his own son, while he should have seen George Zimmerman as his own son too. Because then when you do that, you level the playing field in terms of being able to see. You see, if I look at George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin as my two sons who had this situation, I now have a better outlook of being able to see what is reality or what I believe reality should be. Because even if that's the case, people can have different, different agreements, even if it was the two kids, what should happen? And you can have two different opinions on that. But what it does is give you the ability to have equilibrium in that. It gives you the ability to say, I'm not looking at it as Trayvon Martin looks like me or doesn't look like me or George Zimmerman looks like me and doesn't look like me but because of what they look like now gets out of the picture if I book at them as both my kids now it doesn't matter because they're both mine and part of the problem that we have as a nation today is this idea of tribalism it is the thing that everybody's upset about and tearing the country apart but that doesn't mean that African Americans don't suffer from systematic racism in situations and in many situations. In getting jobs, in the, in the system of dealing with the, the, the court system, in the aspect of um, you know, how they're treated by individuals. I have one client specifically right now who is trying to get a fraud case taken care of that somebody stole from him $13,000. And he can't get the police to investigate it. Why? Well, if you met him, you would see he doesn't come across as very, very eloquent. He doesn't explain himself well. He's got a lot of cognitive and behavioral issues. And they just dismiss him outright. And it, it breaks my heart. The fact of the matter is that's not what should be happening. Not in any society. 
You see, I look at him as somebody who I want to help to, you know, help get, get, get taken care of. And I've worked out and trying to help him to do that now. But the point is, that's how we help people, by looking at them as our own. What would you do if somebody stole $15,000 from your father or $20,000? What would you do for, that, for, the, for, you, for your father? What do you, would you go out of your way? So what we're trying to understand is who do we relate to and why? In arresting somebody when they, there was already proof that they were in their own home. And number three, what I think we know separate and apart from this incident is that uh, there is a long history in this country of African Americans and Latinos uh, being stopped by law enforcement disproportionately. Now, again, this goes to the bias of Barack Obama in this particular case, because it, earlier in the video, he absolutely acknowledged that the police going over to Mr. Gates and trying to figure out what was going on was absolutely appropriate. He actually says, yeah, they, they followed what they were supposed to do. It wasn't a stop and frisk type of situation, and Mr. Gates was caught up in it. It was a situation that Mr. Gates was, was trying to jimmy a house. Somebody else made a phone call. The police come to find out what's going on. And he's arrested for disorderly conduct, his behavior. Is there a video of his behavior? Did Barack Obama hear about the behavior? No. He makes the snap judgment. He's my friend. I relate to him. The police were wrong. Now you tell me, what was the reason why? Was it because the police did something to, 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 that give information to Barack Obama? Or did he do it because he related to Mr. Gates and because he related to him and had an identification with him that a bias then comes out and then there's a difference in his behavior, in which case now the police act stupidly. And if you could understand that bias, and you could understand how that manifests, then you could understand how systematic racism would work. It's not overt. It, this is not Jim Crow. This is not, I believe I'm superior to you. This is much more subtle. This is something of, I identify more with one person over another, and because of that identification, there's a favoring that goes on. And that, that's just a fact. As you know, Lynn, uh, when I was in the state legislature in Illinois, we worked on a racial profiling uh, bill because there was indisputable evidence that blacks and Hispanics were being stopped disproportionately. Uh, and that is a sign, an example of how you know, race remains a factor in the society. Now, I'm, I'm going to show you again how Barack Obama here makes another false analogy, which is the idea that in situations where uh, blacks and Hispanics were um, disproportionately stopped, well, I'm going to ask you the question, was there a proportionate crime? Because if you're going to be in areas where there are higher crime rates, are you going to find there's going to be a disparity by how many people you're going to stop at that point? So that's what the issue is, and that's the question. So I really, it, it gets turned on its head. Everything becomes a, a, a talking point. There isn't a look for truth. It's, I have an opinion how things should be, therefore now it's not that way, that's systematic racism. That's untrue. And that's why so many people reject the idea of systematic racism. Because that inherently doesn't feel right to anybody. What do you mean? You don't even ask the question about who's committing more crime. Who's going to get more arrested more often? Or what neighborhoods have more crime in it? The, the statistic, just an objective statistic, of how many murders take place in the United States and what is the color of the person being murdered and the color of the murderer. That's a statement of fact. That's not an opinion. Nobody can sit and make an argument that that's not the case. So if you were arresting more murderers, you'd go, oh my God, systematic racism. If every murderer was caught, right, every single person that committed a murder was caught, and you'd say, look, systematic racism on murder. Well, no. The aspect is there are more murderers that way. But how you treat the murderers, that's where it would come in. Does the murderer who murdered this person and the murderer who murdered this person get the same amount of time? 
even though their crime was incredibly similar? Does the, does the white individual, the Hispanic individual, the Jewish individual, the Muslim individual all get the same time for the same crime? That would give you an indication about whether or not things are being fair or not. Because one of my biggest issues is judges' discretion have caused a tremendous problem in the idea that our court systems are fair. And in reality, if you take a look and you've been in them and you see what goes on, it doesn't feel fair to anybody. There are people getting off who've done the same crime and then another person does three or four years because of the same exact crime. The pressure put on the Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman investigation with three agencies was much greater than any other place. George Zimmerman was under much more pressure in terms of what was going on with him than somebody else who killed somebody else. I hope you'd all agree with that. I don't, if there's anybody out there who would say, no, every single person that killed somebody that year was investigated and looked at the same way as George Zimmerman was. Do you think that was the case? If you say no, then you understand how systematic racism works. Here is just the opposite direction. And again, people didn't think this was fair. As I don't. Because you hear the inherent bias. I want to show you one last thing before we end. This is a chart for racial dispar disparity in judges in courts. You'll notice that 71% of them are white. We have 14% uh, that are black. 10% uh, that are, uh, wait, 1%, uh, one, 1%, one percent, sorry, 1% Hispanic, 8%, no, it's 10% Hispanic, excuse me, 8% multicultural, 3% Asian American, and 1% Native American. So I'm going to ask you just this one question to think about. If one out of every 10 judges reacts in a similar way to a Barack Obama and talks about the idea that they relate to the, the person that's the victim more than the perpetrator, or they relate more to one side or another because of their own internal bias, as Barack Obama showed when he talked about these cases. And admittedly so, by the way, in the second case, he admitted his bias. But think about this for a minute. If you're going to have any amount of bias, and it's going to be over a long, you know, big group, and you're going to see great changes in disparity. You can see systematic racism. I hope this clarifies that. I hope that this makes sense. And again, if you like this video, hit like. If you disagree with anything I said in this video, please tell me. Write it down. I'd love to hear it. If you haven't subscribed already, please do. And if you'd like to become a patron to this endeavor, um, please hit the subscribe star link below. And I thank you very much. I wish you a good night and good mental health.